This morning's scripture lesson is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 37, and it's a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount that we've been listening to for the past several weeks. You have heard that it was said to those in ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not, shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that and everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right, right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those in ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. So who wants to preach this morning? <laughs> this is a tough passage. It's one of those Sundays I wish I wasn't a lectionary preacher. Did they say a million times? <laughs> wow. To you, Lulu? Oh, okay. All right. Good. Well, that's understandable. We all know Kathy. <laughs> Mary Lou, you want to preach? Okay. Uh, I have some accountability partners in uh, the life of the church, including our music ministry that picks the music based on the scriptures well in advance. So I can't just say, this is a tough one. I'm not going to preach on it. So um, I'm kind of stuck. But it keeps me honest, right? And that's part of the joy of this passage as well. So here we go. Jesus is not messing around here, is he? He's speaking directly to the crowd in a way that is surely getting their attention. Just as we felt hearing it this morning, they surely were thinking, wait a minute, he's talking about me. No longer speaking of that beautiful spiritual plane of God's realm where we are blessed and we are challenged. Here Jesus offers what appears to be more fodder for gossips. Who's doing what and who is sinning? His point is pretty clear. Here we move from the grand idea of being salt and light and blessing to the nitty-gritty of real life. And there's no small standard here. The bar is set really high. Jesus reminds us that our words and actions matter, whatever they are, and they matter especially to God. Every day we're confronted by choices. 
that test our faith. Some are big and some are small, and yet we all strive to be on the right path, and we all long for the blessings of God. Every choice, every action and decision are open to interpretation. That's why there's such a wide range of understanding of what is good or ethical. John Wesley wrote, Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, in all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. So what is the good that we're called to do? What are the means that we have to do them? Where are we called to do good and with whom? These are the questions that help us grow in our faith as we struggle to discern them. Now remember, as Julie mentioned, that we are still in the Sermon on the Mount when we hear these hard words. We have moved from beatitudes or blesseds to this invitation to be salt and light and now these strong and pointed teachings of Jesus. It's getting real now. And we all know that we aren't supposed to murder, right? Even Jesus' original audience knew the Ten Commandments, but here Jesus says we aren't even supposed to be angry, not even to say, you fool. I don't know about you, but I have used way worse language than that. I've certainly been angry as well. Next, Jesus tackles adultery, another known religious law. Jesus says that even to lust is the same as adultery. And we're supposed to rip out those parts of us that cause us to sin, even if we don't commit the sin. And divorce is narrowed by Jesus to some pretty harsh implications. And finally, we are not to swear at all. These passages have been used to judge and shame and harass people forever. Jesus' words have been used as swords to harm those who've strayed from the path. And according to these high standards, we've all strayed from the path. These teachings had even been used to keep people out of church. And just as the Beatitudes offered a second part to those blessings, blessed are those who, for they will, so too does this part of Jesus' teaching. And with regard to anger, Jesus invites us to reconciliation. We're to make amends and settle things with those whom we have, with whom we have broken relationships, particularly before we come before God in worship or praise. With regard to adultery, Jesus invites us to live with a deeper integrity. It's not enough not to sin. We're invited not to even think of sinning. When we hold sinful thoughts, even if we don't act on them, they're still part of our being. And we know that that can lead to temptation and get in the way of healthy relationship. And while Jesus' idea of literally cutting off that sinful part may seem gross, it's less so if we think of it more as cutting off that idea that lies within. As far as divorce, we all know how complicated that can be. One of the wedding liturgies invites us to enter into marriage reverently and not lightly. Entwining our lives together means that they're not easily untangled. We know that. Maybe Jesus invites us to simply take that seriously, not as a source of shame, but to reflect the reality that we impact the lives we share. Of course, it's a whole nother sermon to get into the role of women in this passage and in Jesus' time and culture in particular. 
that has fostered the subjugation of women for centuries, but I'm trying to stay away from that sin of anger, so that's another sermon. Finally, the swearing and bearing false witness. Jesus invites us to be people of the word and our word. If we want to be taken seriously, we must say what we mean and mean what we say. In short, this is all about relationships. Relationships with God and with each other. We are called to be blessed and to live our lives in a way that shine the light of God's love in our world. But we can't do that if we're not people of integrity. It's not really about rigid rules, but about living in a way that people will take us seriously, that they will see God's light and love through our very lives. And it's in that struggle as people of faith that we grow. We all walk that balance between what is right and what is wrong, what's good for us and what's good for our community, what we want to do and what God wants to do. It's not about perfection. It's about growth. And there's no better way to grow than through recognizing our mistakes, our weaknesses, our sins, those places where we have broken relationship with God and with each other, sometimes through no fault of our own, sometimes intentionally. And we make amends. Everyone in this room knows what a broken relationship is like of one kind or another. Even if it's not a permanent break, you know, we've all said something to a friend that hurt their feelings. We've all dropped the ball on our side of a relationship. We've all been short-tempered, maybe even mean-spirited. You know where I'm the worst at it? With my own kids. And if I could take back the things I've said in the heat of my anger, I'd do it. But every time we acknowledge that, every time we stop ourselves and say that was wrong, and we apologize, and we make amends, we're stronger for it, and the relationship is stronger for it. That's what God invites us to. That's the struggle to live as people of faith and integrity. And we all know that living in such a way is a challenge. But we also know that it's through that challenge that we come into contact with the blessings of God. I want to close with a little poem written by another faith community who were invited to reflect on this passage and they created this. It's entitled, Blessed Are. Blessed are those who stay brave and courageous. Wise are those who know when to bite their tongue. Blessed are those who speak the truth when truth is hard to come by. Wise are those who are grateful. Blessed are those who choose love. Blessed are those who are kind. Blessed are those who are challenged so that they may achieve growth. Wise are those who pay attention. Wise are those who swim patiently in urgency. Wise are those who seek to listen and to understand. Blessed are those who listen in love. Wise are those who keep the peace. Blessed are those who hold hope for tomorrow. Wise are those who welcome and share the feast. Blessed are those who grow in God's love. Amen.